Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 39th week of 2017. I'm Carl Osterbrook. For more than a quarter century, this program has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station and now via Urbana Public TV and YouTube. Our program's name, News from Neptune, comes from Noam Chomsky, who's been writing sensible things about U.S. politics for more than half a century. Chomsky says in the U.S. media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Tonight, David Green and I will try to say some true things on News from Neptune, and with thanks to J.B. Nicholson, Dr. No. Uh, as of uh, this week, I'm going to place uh, No's notes uh, on the Facebook page for News from Neptune, so you can follow the uh, Im important and worthwhile information that he's been uh, uh, favoring us with. We bear in mind here Rosa Luxemburg's remark, the most revolutionary thing one can do is always to procra proclaim loudly what is happening. Uh, we'll try to do that uh, tonight, particularly in regard to a conference uh, that's going on on the campus of the little university around the corner uh, right now. Uh, David has uh, screwed his courage to the sticking place and gone over and listened to this conference, act actually, uh, which very few people in the uh, political uh, departments of the university do. But they had a very interesting speaker that I want to hear some more about tonight. So you, uh, oh, I would say there was one peculiar thing about it. Uh, the unit, as they say on the campus, the unit that is sponsoring this particular discussion is uh, called CSAME-S, the Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Now, surely somebody, when they put that together, said that an acronym that said CSAME-S wasn't a good idea. Surely they should be seeing different S, right? Okay, I'll ask David. Did they see any different S today? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't. I, I should have a, a, a similar comment about Actus, which I think is also <laughs> <laughs> what you know. So I'm like you take some, has been a, something you take for an upset stomach, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Take so, two Actus and call yeah, me in the yeah, morning. Okay, you know? yeah, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, so the I didn't go to the conference. I went to hear Trita Parsi, uh -huh. and uh, the conference is still going on as we speak on on Friday at noon. Um, and um, it isn't that I would have gone to the rest of the conference because I find some of the information probably a little, a little too technical, a little too insider. Uh, but w I did go to hear Trita Parsi, the 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 Iran Iranian, uh, Iranian American, presumably you know, Iran Iranian American mm -hmm. uh, young man. Doesn't look like he's anywhere near forty. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. And uh, but who has uh, gained uh, a. a a, a deserved measure of re, of re, recognition for his heading of an ira of a center. I should have the exact name of that, but he. Well, I, I guess does he work for the Institute of Policy Studies or is it some? No, I think it's another Iranian American. Yeah, he's founded his own some, Amer Iranian his own American. Policy, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he's become a regular yeah. political center, right? Yeah, he's become a regular commentator on the the Real News Network, which I I right. talked with him about afterwards, and he said he. Thought that that's really working out well. He had a recent series on the Real News Network with with Paul Jay, uh, within a series called Reality Asserts Itself, where Paul Jay tries to explore people's background as well as their views on the the current the current scene. And uh, that's probably a total of a little more than an hour interviews. I think it was three parts, a little shorter than some of the other more extended interviews he does with people. But I'm sure he'll be appearing quite regularly. Uh, Moving forward on that program, commenting on on, on Iran um, after his talk, which had to do with the ins and outs of the way that the the nuclear deal went down a couple years ago, uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I asked him a couple questions that I, that that you know uh, there was many questions. I'm going to talk about my questions because I recall them better and and I recall his answers better. I asked him about the role of the Israel lobby, what his perspective was on the role of the Israel lobby in the manner in which the Iran deal went down. He talked, he talked quite a bit about Israel and their obvious opposition to the Iran deal uh, during the years prior and as, as, the, as the deal unfolded. Um, and he said that he thought that if, if Netanyahu had, quote, hugged the deal 
instead of so adamantly adamantly opposing it that he might have been more might have been more effective at at the result of there not being an Iran deal that the fact that that he, that that Netanyahu and Israel were so adamant against that kind of forced the U.S.'s hand because as Parsi talked about there was there were three clocks ticking uh, in relation to Iran. One was the clock of the Iran developing nuclear weapons. The other was that of the sanctions that the U.S. imposed which were making the the Iranian economy scream and the third was that Israel was threatening war and that three these three clocks ticking the United States uh, basically you know Iran's determination to suff suffer economically continue its development of the nuclear program and the United States under Obama's ultimate opposition to attacking attacking Iran basically forced the deal and made Netanyahu's op opposition ultimately in, in, in effective. Uh, that was and 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 uh, in asking about the Israel lobby, what Parsi said was that it's interesting how ineffectually the Israel lobby can be when the U.S. public mobilizes itself in relation to this. That was one example he gave, and the other example was he gave was the efforts to go to war in Syria in twenty in twenty thirteen. He said that was another time when the U.S. public and he didn't really you know you know distinguish between you know any aspect of whatever but people when people thought we were going to go to war in Syria in the fall late summer fall of 2013 uh, congresspersons according to him were getting like 97 percent don't go to war and the Israel lobby whatever its views were at that time couldn't stand stand up to that so that was one question I, I asked him about the Israel lobby uh, important points yeah and the other the other question I asked him was a more general question I could because what, what we confronted with, even with somebody who is obviously very critical of U.S. foreign policy um, and, and would probably prefer that the United States wasn't involved in the Middle East at all in the way that it is, he, I asked him, you know, what, when, you're, when you're thinking about why, you know, the big picture of why, why it is we're even over there and why we think we, we can do whatever we want, why we think it's our interests and our business to do in the Middle East, and everybody, of course, knows why that is, and and in relation to to oil, um, uh, I, I asked him to to think about that, and what he what he did say, and he, he I think agrees with that with that general point, but what he what he did say was that um, the Middle East isn't as important in the U.S. Uh, strategy as it was five or ten or, or fifteen years uh -huh. ago. He during his talk, he really stressed that the fact that you know, which is obvious that the our invasion of uh, and occupation of Iraq in 2003 basically destabilized the, the Middle East, changed the status quo, um, uh, failed in what it what it want, wanted to do, brought Iran, gave it even, Iran even more power, and has forced the, yep. the you know, United States hand in 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 other ways, which of course has been to the displeasure of both Israel and Saudi. Uh, and Saudi, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So, um, the, uh, you know, he, he stressed, uh, Parsi tr stressed that the, the pivot to Asia has, has been a result of the fact that our primary concerns are, again, with China and Russia, and not so much directly with, e with energy resources, which, and, and this is a you know, debatable point. I know, Carl, you always say, and, that's, and it's important to say, that we don't need the oil. We've got the oil. Exactly. But the point is we've got even more, uh, given the, right. the, 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 the you know, amount of natural gas we have available now, which we, of course, shouldn't be pulling out of the ground anyway, but we do, and that's giving us leverage, quote-unquote, in relation to Middle Eastern oil. Exactly. We still need the oil, but the, the primary concerns are perhaps more general in terms of China and Russia's influence in in the, the region, and so that that in in a sense what the in Iraq 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 invasion generated and what the Obama Obama administration uh, endeavored endeavored to you know to do in this in this pivot pivot mm -hmm. to Asia um, has taken 
has sort of decentered the Middle East from our, our general global concerns. I'd like to take that point up particularly. I think that's mm -hmm. extremely important, and uh, I'd like to certainly hear more from what that uh, mm -hmm. uh, from what was said by Parsi. Uh, Parsi, as you say, is a young man, but he founded uh, 15 years ago uh, something called the Iranian American. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, a, a National Iranian American Council. Uh, and the point of this was precisely to talk to Americans about uh, Iranian politics and what was going on in Iran uh, in a way that was uh, more competent than we were hearing from the uh, mainstream media. And that's been his job uh, as an academic and as a, a UN official, which he was for a while. Um, it's, uh, he's well informed on these matters, and the observations, uh, such as the ones you just quoted, seem to me to be very important indeed. Uh, and I particularly am struck by this notion that the um, uh, Middle East is losing uh, significance for U.S. foreign policy, particularly after almost a generation since the in great crime of the 21st century, the invasion of Iraq, uh, a certain high point there and uh, the disorder and dismay and mass death that resulted from American policy there. Uh, the Middle East is in uh, some ways now less important uh, because of the pivot to Asia, uh, or to put that another way, uh, at the center of U.S. foreign policy uh, for ages immemorial, going back really to, uh, for literally for generations, uh, has been a concern about um, Asia. Uh, about the economic consolidation of, of East Asia particularly, but of Eurasia in general. And American politics, uh, American foreign policy, uh, throughout the 20th century uh, was a, a matter of being concerned about who was going to rule Asia. That's what the unpleasantness with the Japanese in the 1940s was about, right? Uh, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere that Japan spread around the Asia Pacific uh, was a uh, stumbling block for American economic exploitation of Asia, which Americans had been doing since the China trade of the 19th century. All right, uh, the interest in uh, Middle Eastern energy after the uh, Second World War was particularly concerned about the fact that um, uh, Asia imported uh, energy from the Middle East, uh, particularly China, Europe as well. That the reason that uh, the U.S. was concerned about controlling Middle East energy flows, gas and oil, was not just that we use some of it here. As you say, most, most of our, our domestic uh, supplies of energy come from uh, the Atlantic Basin, uh, Canada, uh, Venezuela, uh, Nigeria, and primarily the United States itself. Uh, we get very little of our domestic energy uh, needs from, uh, the, from the Middle East, although our interest in Saudi Arabia involves partially what we import from there. But the real reason we want to control Middle East energy flows is that it's a chokehold on China and on Germany and Japan. Uh, sorry, Germany and China. Uh, <laughs> You, and, you went back 70 years in time there. Well, yeah. exactly. But I mean, but yeah. that was the issue yeah. then in yeah. some ways, too. Sure. Uh, modern, <laughs> but, but the interesting point that you quote Parsi is making is that the centrality of the Middle East to American foreign policy has been declining since the invasion of Iraq. And I think that's right, and I think it's important. And one of the reasons it's been declining is that it's a less effective weapon for retarding Chinese development. Uh, the great shock to American foreign policy in the modern world was the success of the Chinese Revolution. Few Americans realized that the U.S. essentially invaded China in order to put down the 1949, the 1949 revolution, just as it had invaded Russia to put down the 1918 revolution. But that's uh, uh, blood over the dam, right? Um, the fact of the matter is that the U.S. control, the, the Pentagon even has a phrase for it. The Pentagon talks about offshore control and what they do with offshore control. Well, the shore that they're off of is China. 
offshore control means controlling world energy flows so that it could threaten China. Uh, and uh, what's happening now is that China has sidestepped the threat. Uh, part of it coming from its alliance, effective alliance with Russia, and the rest of it coming from its massive program uh, of uh, uh, One Belt, One Road. It's Belt and Road Initiative that wants to set up a uh, Eurasian to Europe uh, flow of materiel that uh, would mean that the American <coughs> attempt to isolate China in regard to energy won't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's, very, that's very important. Now, to come back to Iran, it seems to me that the uh, uh, whole nuclear deal that the Obama administration did with Iran had really very little to do with nukes, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, yes, Iran could have developed a nuclear weapon. Indeed, the U.S. offered them to the Sh to Iran when the Shah ruled Iran. Right? The Shah was our boy, and therefore, uh, you know, hey, sure, you can have a nuclear weapon if you want. But once the Shah was no longer in charge, uh, suddenly the American attitude changed. Everyone admits everyone who's serious about the matter admits that Iran was not building a nuclear weapon during the Obama administration. And the Obama administration said that they were negotiating to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. What they were really negotiating for, what the Obama administration really wanted to do, is to reincorporate Iran into the overall framework of order, odor, of order, as Henry Kissinger said, uh, that controlled Middle East oil. Uh, the Iran, which was perfectly um, uh, complacent with American direction, so long as the Shah ruled, uh, suddenly was not part of the overall framework of order that controlled oil uh, once the Shah was overthrown. Uh, and so what the, what the Obama administration was trying to do was to reincorporate Iran into that structure of order that meant that U.S worldwide control of energy flows would be to some extent restored. That's what they really wanted to do, and to some extent they have done that. Uh, but the great fear now is that the uh, incorporation of Iran into the Russian and Chinese uh, uh, organization of Eurasia uh, brings that bit of control to an end. Uh, that's why the uh, Obama administration uh, was uh, so anxious to restore its system of control and why it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked because of the conjunction of China, Russia, and Iran. And that's why the neocons who are directing American foreign policy are threatening war, and they might even mean it, to try to prevent this conjunction between Iran, Russia, and China. And it's in those circumstances that this important uh, conference, or at least the subject is important, uh, is going on on, on campus. And uh, uh, I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say about what Parsi had to say about it, particularly the notion that there really is a shift here. The, new, the Middle East is not so important to American policy the way it used to be. Yeah, well, I mean, that's basically it. I, I don't... He didn't. It was it was an answer to my question that he said that, and and he didn't elaborate it on on it all that much. But it was it was of note that 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 he said that. I mean, you use the word neocons there again. I think it's fair to ask, well, how loosely are we using that word? I mean, are these the, the neocons that took Bush into Iraq in two thousand three and what were Obamas? And this is, I think, Parsi's narrative of the manner in which the nuclear deal went down un, under under you know Obama gives a certain amount of implicit and, and explicit credit to Obama for being shrewder at least and perhaps more peaceful in his own way uh, in relation to Middle Eastern policy than the the, the Bushies uh, and so um, the question is that whether these these were no longer neocons. Of course, he didn't mention Hillary Clinton, and I was going to ask him about uh -huh. that, too, as well. But Hillary Clinton, just he talked about John Kerry a lot because, of course, he was secretary of state by the time, by the time that the Iran thing was com coming to, coming to uh, you know, ahead after, after 2012 or beginning at the end of 2012 and then on into the, the, the second Ob Obama administration. But the question is what, you know, 
we're, we're, are, what is this division between the, the, the Bush neocons and the, and the Obama neocons? Mm. And how much credit, how much sort of uh, even at a moral level, at least strategic level, um, Obama deserves for pursuing a strategy that was at least somewhat less dangerous than uh, immediately dangerous than might have been uh, that might have might have gone down, say, if, if Romney had been elected president in 2012 or McCain, well, McCain in 2000, in 2008. The question is, do you want a nice murderer or a nasty murderer? Uh, uh, the, uh, as Noam Chomsky says, the greatest terrorist program of the modern world right. was uh, Obama's drone campaign. It killed literally thousands of people, yeah. most, the overwhelming majority non-combatants. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you got a, a nicer murderer rather than a nasty murderer. Yeah. But still in all, uh, yeah. we get, uh, we, we, it's worthwhile to understand, it seems to me, what the United States government is doing, and by the government here I don't necessarily mean the White House or the President, what I mean is the continuous policy that's being carried out by the American establishment, if you want to call it the deep state, fine, that sounds a little conspiratorial, we don't have to be that conspiratorial, we have a political establishment in this country that has run foreign policy on a, in a consistent fashion, even if there are sometimes arguments of detail and so forth, uh, in a consistent fashion since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, I, uh, I, I, I have a paper on that from uh, our, our conference uh, a week ago uh, yeah. that I will also put on the, uh, on the Facebook page for mm -hmm. uh, News from Neptune. Uh, but the, the, the point here is that the, what the U.S. is doing um, uh, remains remarkably consistent uh, with the characteristic of being hidden from most Americans. Uh, what we hear everything from weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to uh, uh, how we're going to save the world from uh, the mad North Koreans and so forth. Uh, what we hear is material crafted for the consumption of the American public, not just the world public, but particularly the American public, because the American public is the only enemy that the political establishment, the deep state, the American permanent government, fears. The only, one it, the only thing it fears is popular opinion. Uh, the popular opinion, for example, that produced the civil rights movement, the withdrawal from Vietnam, that's what an American government policy is threatened by, and therefore <coughs> a collection of lies and uh, complaints uh, from the political establishment is essential, is essential to keep that in place. Uh, so what we're really talking about here is what is the American government really doing in its war policy, in its foreign policy, uh, as opposed to what it says it's doing, yeah. uh, regardless of who in that, in that um, panoply of, uh, uh, of clowns and mountain banks we happen to be talking about at the time. Mm -hmm. What, um, two points. Um, one thing that, that Parsi stressed uh, during his talk, or not maybe not stressed, but he sort of enlightened us on, was the fact that Israel continued to support Iran's role in the Middle East after the Iran Iranian revolution in 79 all the way through 91 that and and I always had associated that just with the fact that they were all their their you know Mac all of Israel Israel's arms dealing machinations around mm -hmm. the Iran Contra affair and so on and so forth I never really had had understood that as an Israeli policy to maintain fairly strong contacts with you know Iran, perhaps it was just with Iran's military establishment, which may have carried over from the Shah to mm -hmm. to the, the to the you know the mullahs. Um, he stressed that as well, but the, he said that that didn't. And what what Parsi refers to as the collapse of the of the Pax Pax the 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 Pax Amer, you know, Amer, Americana um, uh, from uh, during the period of ninety one to two thousand three after the first Persian Gulf War and during that period right. of sanctions and, and, and so forth, was really that, that collapse, uh, that sort of shift, is really what caused Iran to sort of reassert itself, to begin to reassert itself in the, you know, the region. So um, a little, you know, sort of a complicated understanding yeah. Yeah, of, of uh, how all that played out in that period of time. 
And it's an important distinction because, of course, the way it's presented in this country all the time is that, uh, yeah. you know, the vast sea of Arabs are about to devour brave yeah. little Israel, and yeah. therefore we've got to keep killing a lot of people in the Middle East to keep that vast sea of Arabs from yeah. doing so. This is all nonsense. This yeah. is all, it, uh, uh, it ignores such things as the point you just made yeah. about yeah. Iranian-Israeli uh, <laughs> relations uh, after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Um, uh, but uh, the matter, uh, I think, particularly for us, but indeed for anyone who wants a, an account of what's going on, has to take into account American policy. Um, uh, American p policy, uh, well, uh, start this way. What year did the Israelis destroy the Iraqi reactor? Uh, uh, 81. It was 81. Yeah. And uh, this, I think, was... the 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 understanding in Israel as far as who its friends and enemies were. Uh, the notion that Iraq uh, was a rival to Israel's cadetship, so to speak, uh, for American uh, 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 patronage, um, uh, and it was probably right. I mean, the U.S. was mm -hmm. supporting and sponsoring mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. uh, up to the 91 war, yeah. and in some ways even after that. Yeah. Uh, but from 80 to 91, what was going on was a certain uh, sibling rivalry uh, yeah. between Iraq and yeah. Israel for yeah. the notice of the American mm -hmm. establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, once the Iranian revolution, uh, well, put it this way, the, the uh, Iraq war the Iraq-Iran war, which the U.S. encouraged mm -hmm. to punish Iran for getting off the reservation. And again, which Israel continued to, to supply Iran weapons in that context. Well, in that, that I think we have to go into the details of that, but it seems to me the way that looked from Israel was, well, Look, uh, it's like Harry Truman when when keep when them, Germany attacked fighting, uh, Russia. Fighting, right. Yeah, keep yeah. them fighting, and yeah. they'll kill each right. other, no, and it'll exactly. be good for us. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the um, I, I think one of the points that Trita Parsi makes in his writings mm -hmm. uh, that, is that the fights in the Middle East are not finally about ideology. Yeah. It's not about Zionism versus Islam versus Shiism versus Sh yeah, okay. Sunni, except to the point that the U.S. encourages this popularly in the, in the yeah, region. Yeah. But those aren't really the issues. The real issues are strategic. The real issues are, are strategic in the sense that yeah. what they're thinking about in Israel is how do we relate to the other powers in the region and who are our rivals? Mm -hmm. And how do we get the United States uh, to destroy our rivals and support people who might be our friends. The idea a few years ago, from a few years ago, that the, uh, if one were thinking about this a few years ago and suggesting that there would be an effective alliance between Saudi Arabia and Israel, yeah. that would have been seen as strange. But that's what we've got right now. Yeah. Because of this uh, uh, strategic rather than ideological calculus yeah. that uh, uh, the American carapace uh, provides for the Middle East. Yeah. Parsi has made this point particularly, and I think he's right. Yeah, let me just correct one thing I've said that I, I didn't I didn't interpret my notes properly here. But I think what Parsi, when Parsi referred to Pax Pax, Amer, Pax Americana, he was referring to the period from ninety one to two thousand three, in which you know left left alone the you know a weakened, uh, a fairly weakened Saddam Hussein under under sanctions, uh, and. So, so, you know, Saudi Saudi Arabia uh, feeling not, you know, not threatened in, in that context. Um, that was, in, in strategic terms, a relatively stable context. And then the invasion of Iraq in 2003 brought Iran, what he, ref he referred to, Parsi referred to Iran as that, as that invasion, being a bless, blessing and blessing in disguise, and and it's hard to see in retrospect what American planners and strategists were thinking in basically what everyone understands now that e Iraq is a, a Shiite country, is a dominantly Shiite country, in which after 
they were in a sense be did, determined determined their own political leaders after the fall of of Saddam Hussein, then Iran's influence increased in that context. And there's some there's some subtleties to how that influence actually plays out out now now that it isn't like Iran necessarily dominates Iraq, but but in any in any event. Um, a very complicated reason, and a very complicated region, obviously made complicated by our interests in that region. It would be complicated enough, but um, the only the only simple thing about it is understanding that we're doing whatever we can do to maintain leverage among among the countries in that region, whether it's in, in the manner in which we ally ourselves with them or or, or you know, oppose, oppose them. But it's strategy, not ideology. We're yes. not fighting for peace, freedom, and justice, or yeah. democracy. Well, We're fighting for the control of it, Middle East energy resources. I have to remind myself every so often that people don't understand that. Whenever yeah. people start talking about interfaith understanding and right. the Israel-Palestine conflict, right. or in, interfaith understanding in the Middle East, and if we only st understood Islam better, if, we, yeah. if they only understood uh, Judaism or Christianity or any other ism that you can think of, that I mean, it's been so long since I cared about any of that. That stuff because it's obvious I mean if people are interested in that stuff that's fine but it doesn't have anything to do and you can even see that in the in the, the strain the, the the strange the strange ano, you know ano, you know anomalies in the alliances whereas Hamas represents a Palestinian people of Sunni background and all of a sudden they're part of the the Sunni evil the, right. the Shiite evil triangle it's Hezbollah and Syria where it's governed by a minority Shia regime which is what a, a, you know Assad is and then and then and then and then Iran so you've got this you've got this this Shia confluence there and they take up the cause of of of, of Hamas obviously not because they see them as their their co-religionists in a Shiite sense but because of the way they relating to to Israel and their domination of the the Palestinians so when you refer to that stuff, you mean the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's. <laughs> I, that's I have stuff. a certain interest in that's, that stuff yeah, myself. The, you know, yeah, I mean, but, uh, I, I do too. I do too. And, uh, but uh, yeah. but I, I I still think it's important to make the point that Trita Parsi uh, made apparently in the talk this morning uh, on uh, campus yeah. that what we're talking about here is uh, ideology and politics. Sorry, what we're talking about here is strategy and yeah. politics, and not ideology. Yeah. Uh, whereby we have to say, uh, yes, yeah. it's uh, Islam. That's I, don't, I don't think I don't think Parsi used the words Islam, Sunni, or Shia. Uh, well, than once and or that twice would be consistent whole, with what he's talk. been saying. He, says, and, you know, he was talking about 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 diplomats. He was telling a story of how the Iran deal went down and all the back channel deals and the Oman was involved in that. Apparently, the the leader, the Sultan of, of you know Oman, was the only person on earth who could actually talk to both the Iranian to everybody and and the and the and the American leaders uh -huh. with openness and confidence mm -hmm. at at the same time. And he would, whoever this person is, uh, is very very vital in the Iran deal being being pulled off. So yeah, you're watching uh, news from Neptune. Uh, Carl Estabrook and David Green talking about the news of the week and its coverage by the media. Uh, I want to shift focus a bit here to a, another subject. We were talking about the <clears throat> Middle East uh, and Iran and the uh, possibilities of American foreign po possibilities for American foreign policy uh, in the region. None of them very good. Yeah. Uh, but I'd like to say something about the uh, uh, a program I haven't seen. The program I haven't seen is the uh, Burns Novak. Uh, Vietnam that's been on public broadcasting uh, this last couple of weeks. Uh, the uh, best comment I have seen on the program comes from the Australia, Australian John Pilger, uh, who has uh, a reporter and filmmaker uh, and uh, insightful analyst of the uh, of, of world politics, not just American. Uh, Pilcher has an article this week entitled "The Killing, uh, the Killing of History," and the uh, uh, gerund has a lot of weight because there's a lot of killing he has to talk about. Uh, it's an analysis of the uh, or a review of the Burns Novak 
uh, Vietnam program uh, that points out uh, just what a work of propaganda uh, this series uh, series is. Uh, and I think that's important because um, what's going on here is the long-term attempt by the American political establishment uh, to recoup its losses uh, in from the great crime of the post-war world, that is, uh, the killing of four million Southeast Asians by the United States uh, in order to, quote, stop communism. Uh, this is so wrong, so mistaken, so misinterpreted that uh, the continuation of the misinterpretation that we find in the PBS program on Vietnam needs to be called by its right name. And Pilger, I think, has done it. Have you been able to watch any of the program, David? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Good. Uh, good terminology. Have you been able? Yeah, I, was, I, 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 was I literally able. meant to watch it and able. wasn't able no, to. No, I wasn't. Yeah. I mean, I was able in, in terms of, of time. time I'm commitments and I have I have a television yeah, it was that, psychological on which ability. I receive PBS. No, I'm but I'm not able in the sense of actually I may be different from you in this regard. I am actually not. You're usually the one who who's uh, no, I can't watch that. But <laughs> but uh, uh, I I am really not able in in the sense of uh, sort of wanting to endure the the um, what I know will be the sort of. Uh, propagandistic framework, exactly. uh, the, the typical Bernsean propagandistic framework in which he discussed the Civil War and many, a uh, few other things uh, since then. Um, so, no, I, I'm not, I'm, and it sort of re reflects my dis disillusion with almost anything that comes out of the mainstream media these days. I, I pretty much stick to stuff that's online, and and so Short answer, no, I didn't watch it. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 as I say... I read about it. I read about what other people had to say about it. My failure was a, a failure of nerve, a moral uh, failure more than anything else, yeah, because I really yeah. w did want to see yeah. it and couldn't bring myself to watch it the same way that yeah, uh, yeah. you can't... Uh, yeah. watch a film of your auto crash or something well, like that. Well, yeah, I know. mean, I, I kind of agree with Paul Streetis. I don't have 17 hours to watch this. I got, no. you know, I've, I've got I've got some things to get done. I'm not saying I don't do stuff for fun, but this this doesn't fall under that category. And uh, so I, I spent the 17 hours probably um, sitting, if insofar as it was on when I was sitting on my couch, I probably had a ball game on and was on my laptop reading about um, some of the issues that we, we talk about the regular, fundamental, regularly on this program. The fundamental points about the Vietnam War, when did it start, when did it end, why did it end, so yeah, forth, yeah. all of that is lost to our the popular propaganda view that we have in this we have in this country. It was the Kennedy administration that started the uh, that started the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War ended uh, uh, insofar as it did uh, by the fact that the American conscript army in Vietnam, the army of draftees, revolted and refused to fight and therefore had to be withdrawn. And when the war actually came to an end, the fighting came to an end in 75, when the smoke cleared, it was obvious that the United States had won. The notion that the United States lost in Vietnam uh, makes sense only if you pay attention to uh, uh, America's uh, um, maximum war aims, you might say. Uh, the principal w reason for the war, from the American point of view, was to show that no peasant society, uh, in, particularly in a East Asia, uh, w was to be allowed to develop itself economically outside of the control of the American hegemony uh, that had been established by the Second World War. We run the world economy. Who are these Vietnamese peasants who say that they're going to run their economy in a different fashion? And on that point, the U.S. won across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we destroyed that country, killed four million people in the region, and uh, uh, Vietnam, when the smoke cleared, Vietnam was begging for Nike shoe factories so mm -hmm. that uh, it could have something to do, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, from the American point let, of view, the war was won. Let me, let me just review the people that were most important to read in regard to the Vietnam War. One is the, <coughs> the gentleman who wrote this book later on in his life, and early on he made himself even more famous, he'd already been a famous linguist, he made himself more famous by 
opposing the Vietnam War and, and uh, Noam Chomsky's work on, on uh, war in Southeast, in, in war in Asia and so forth, um, was fundamental in that regards. And then at the same time, the revisionist historian Gabriel Kolko wrote a couple of books about the Vietnam War, Annette, one, 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 is, called, one is called Annette, you know, Anatomy of, of, of War. Um, a lesser-known woman, uh, Marilyn Young, wrote a, a probably what is the single, if one, one wanted to read one book about the Vietnam War, I recall that as being the most sort of concise and comprehensive at the same time. I think her book is just called The Vietnam War or something, and she just died recently, actually. And then another woman who was well-known at the time, Francis, Francis Fitz, you know, Fitzgerald, oh, yes. book called Fire in the, in, the, in the Lake, which is a very good read, a very good narrative read about opposed to the Vietnam War. And then if you wanted to add on to that, Daniel Ellsberg's, he didn't write the Pentagon Papers, he just stole them. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you can yeah, probably good read, idea too. You could read the Pentagon Papers. Actually, I, I have to say, uh, in the summer of 1971, I was taking trains around Europe and reading the International Herald, Herald Tribune when the Pentagon Papers, which is published by the, the New York Times, which was publishing the Pentagon Papers. So every day you have plenty of time to, to kill waiting in a train station or, you know, it's not time to go drinking yet or whatever. And uh, so I read the Pentagon Papers through pretty thoroughly in, the, in, that, in that context in the summer it of 71. It might be worthwhile to say what the Pentagon education. Papers were. You and, and I know, but the I think... The Pentagon Papers yeah. were, well, maybe you know better than I do yeah. in technical terms, but there were... Uh, 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 Daniel Ellsberg was an analyst, started out at Rand yeah. Corporation and went to work for uh, in the, the Pentagon and had access to the documents that uh, showed how our planners and strategists right. were talking about Vietnam. It's the and, Pentagon's and told, history of the war. Told the truth, you right. know, just as the, you read the Wall Street Journal to find out what business is really thinking, right. you read the Pentagon Papers to find out what the, the Pentagon or what the insiders were really thinking about, right. how, why we got into the war how the war was actually going and at certain, at, you know, gave, I'm not sure if the word whistleblower was even used before Ellsberg, but um, he, uh, and there's a film about this, you can see, of course, and, uh, and he, he, uh, he managed to get them to the, the New York, the Washington Post and the, the New York Times and they published them and created a lot of controversy and... Uh, WikiLeaks yeah. before the fact. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, uh, and, and important <clears throat> because what was re what Ellsberg released was the Pentagon's own yeah. honest account of what was going on. We had got a dishonest account, mm -hmm. the domino theory and stopping communism and all the other sort of stuff, all along from the Kennedy administration on. We'd gotten a dishonest account about why we were killing people in Southeast Asia, but the Pentagon, for as an internal document, produce the <clears throat> Pentagon Papers, uh, uh, f which were, of course, secret. I mean, you know, yeah. we are not going to let that stuff get out. And then what Ellsberg did was, in fact, deliver it to the New York Times, which in those days yeah. was willing to publish something like that. Yeah. They wouldn't be today, by the way. Yeah. What was the Ellsberg movie called? A Very Something Man? A Very... Uh, I've forgotten <laughs> now. Very, yeah. Anyway. Yes, I don't know. But a, very, a good account, a good account of that. So. Um, the, uh, it's important in terms of what the history of the war actually was. There is a battle still going on, yeah. an important battle, yeah. uh, over how that war is to be understood in the historical memory of Americans because it's a guide to other wars that we're conducting right now. Uh, remember, uh, there are at least eight wars going on around the world, none of them legal yeah. under the Constitution, <clears throat> that the U.S. is conducting. Uh, now, in this circumstance, uh, what was the line I quoted from Rosa Luxemburg at the beginning of the hour? Uh, telling the truth is the most revolutionary thing you can do. And because uh, of its internal nature, the Pentagon Papers told the truth about the war. And that's why it was so devastating to have that truth uh, um, uh, revealed. This new television series is an attempt to reestablish the propaganda account uh, for that war. Uh, the uh, uh, um, in a society often bereft of historical memory at all and enthralled of the propaganda of its exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, the 
entirely new Vietnam War, that's what Burns calls his account, uh, the entirely new Vietnam War is presented as an epic historic work. Yes, it's right. We've got to restore a, uh, a, a propaganda account here. Its lavish advertising campaign promotes its biggest backer, you may not have noticed this, the Bank of America. It's sponsored. The program is sponsored by the Bank of America. They paid for Ken Burns and his associates to run around and collect all this archival footage and so forth. In 1971, uh, the branch of the Bank of America in Santa Barbara, California, was burnt to the ground by anti-war protesters uh, because of its involvement with the ongoing war. I had for many years on my wall a picture of the burning branch of the Bank of America from 1971, and the caption was, uh, uh, capitalism, no thanks. We will burn your expletive banks. Well, they did burn the bank uh, in 1971 as an anti-war pro protest, and that bank is now sponsoring the new story. Burns says, and I'm quoting here, he's grateful to the entire Bank of America family, <laughs> which has long supported our country's veterans. It's a family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bank of America was a corporate prop to an invasion that killed perhaps as many as four million Vietnamese and ravaged and poisoned a once bountiful land. More than 58,000 American soldiers were killed, and around the same number are estimated to have taken their own lives. That's a remarkable figure, and one I meant to research some before I mentioned it today. Uh, we often talk about the number of Americans who died. Uh, the names supposedly belong on that wall in Washington. Um, 58,000 is a number that's often given, but the idea that an equal number of American vet veterans killed themselves uh, from that war, uh, that's astonishing, and my source for that suggests that it is probably accurate. Uh, John Pilger writes, I, was, I watched the first episode in New York. It leaves you in no doubt of its intentions right from the start. The narrator says the war, quote, was begun in good faith by decent people out of fateful misunderstandings, American overconfidence, and Cold War misunderstandings. Close quote. I don't know whether Burns really wrote a sentence as awkward as that, but the idea behind it is clear, and it seems to me that what we are dealing with here is a uh, sophisticated and expensive uh, bit of propaganda, but hey, the Bank of America is paying for it, so we can uh, yeah. put that by. It's probably it's probably irreverent and trivializing of me to make the following comments, but but uh, just for the state, the sake of the sake of nostalgia, the the University of California Santa Barbara, where some of my high school classmates went off to, uh, was was very well known as the most drug the the community where the mm -hmm. students live. Yeah. I even I knew Isla, that. Isla, yeah. Isla Vista, you knew that all the way on the East Coast was known yeah, well, as yeah, exactly. the most drug infested uh, 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 college campus, at least on the, the West Coast, maybe in the entire country. So I was always kind of bemused in a strange way by the fact that they were the ones to get around to burning down their 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 bank as opposed to to UCLA where I was at the time and there was a there was a nice very friendly uh, target of a of a Bank of America branch right down there in Westwood Village and I think people went down there to, to protest right at that time but we we had the we not we they I was I wasn't among them at that at that particular time uh, it, it didn't didn't burn it down I I suspect that the cops were pretty uh, vigilant about how that demonstration went went down so. That's my personal reflection, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> John Pilger has a, uh, um, uh, in this article that I've been quoting, has a uh, conclusion that takes up uh, an aspect of why uh, this great crime uh, is being presented the way it is right now to the American people, who are, of course, responsible for this great crime. The government were responsible for carried it out. Um, the uh, Pilger quotes uh, the show that Michael Moore brought to Broadway uh, a month or so ago, a show which is really a long campaign uh, um, 
uh, screed against uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and the assumption is that Moore, who's been identified as a, uh, uh, a liberal in the American political uh, firmament, uh, uh, sees the problems that the United States has now and the sort of recuperation that films like this have to do uh, as a, uh, uh, a result of Donald Trump. Uh, that's the problem we have to deal with. Now, that's the view, of course, of the American political establishment, uh, made up the Clinton, the Clinton campaign, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies, uh, the, a good bit of both of the formal parties. Uh, but it is a remarkable exercise in propaganda, <coughs> propaganda uh, and a, uh, uh, a background to the astonishing Russiagate nonsense. Uh, I'm quoting now John Pilger. How did it, it expletive come to this, says Michael Moore in his Broadway show, Terms of My Surrender, a vaudeville for the disaffected set against a backdrop of Trump as Big Brother. That's the problem. I admired Moore's film, Roger and Me, about the economic and social devastation of his hometown of Flint, Michigan, and Sicko, his investigation into the corruption of health care in America. The night I saw his show, he means the, the Broadway show that's on now, uh, his happy, clappy audience cheered Moore's reassurance that, quote, we are the majority, and calls to impeach Trump, a liar and a fascist, close quote. His message seemed to be that, you, that had you held your nose and voted for Hillary Clinton, life would be predictable again. He may be right. Instead of merely abusing the world, as Trump does, the great obliterator, that's uh, Pilger's remark about uh, uh, Clinton, or name for Clinton, Clinton said she would obliterate Iran if Iran would proceed to a nuclear weapon. The great obliterator might have attacked Iran and lobbed missiles at Putin, whom she likened to Hitler, a particular profanity given the 27 million Russians who died in Hitler's invasion. Listen up, said Moore. Putting aside what our governments do, Americans are really loved by the world. There was a silence, writes Pilcher. And I'm happy to say, for the good sense of uh, Broadway audiences, that his show failed miserably on Broadway. <laughs> that may be a, a better comment about this attempt to recoup uh, 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 American Vietnam propaganda. I'm sorry, I won't be able to see that show. Yeah, uh, I was devastated. I had my tickets, I had my tickets, and then all of a sudden it was canceled. Yes. But um, just one, one thing I think deserves to be put at the end of the. Actually, I had this first on my list a couple of days ago. But mm -hmm. um, we've got a situation in Puerto Rico, which is in sharp contrast to a situation that they have in Cuba, even though they both suffer from the same hurricane. I don't know the same hurricanes. I don't know all the details, but uh, I think people have commented on the fact that Cuba is able to deal with these things, whereas Puerto Rico has not. I, I can't think, other than our wars, I can't think of anything more perverse in the sort of neoliberal context of the manner in which Puerto Rico has been killed by debt at, the, at one time. Its economy was killed by debt to banks who refused to cancel these debts. These debts should be canceled now. They should have been canceled before. Puerto Rico can't possibly recover unless its debts are, are canceled. And of course, they can be. Banks have the power to cancel debt. Our, our government has the power to see that banks cancel debt. And, but beyond that, just the, the preparation or the, the infrastructure to deal with a hurricane, the, you know, the, whatever the strategy, strategies are that Cuba, in its, in its impoverished socialistic way, is able to deal with, that Puerto Rico obvious, obviously can't in its colonialist, subordinate context in which um, they haven't been able to run, run their, run their you know, economy even in, at an impoverished level in the last few years, no less prepared to deal with, with circumstances like, like this. So the, the contrast between neoliberalism and what is called socialism in Cuba, and which is very real socialism in certain ways, uh, should be noted. Uh, probably hasn't been, I mean, it's certainly noted in the, the left media, but there's been so much else going on that 
I really haven't even seen uh, all that much about it. But the real news is doing doing some good of their usual good work at in, at, at reporting on that from both an economic and climatological point of view. There are a couple of other points that uh, uh, we would appropriately talk about, I think, in this context. Uh, I'm going to put some articles uh, that refer to them on the Facebook page for News from Neptune. Most notably, a strange and disturbing and interesting uh, and informed account by Alfred McCoy, uh, in which he imagines what a war between the U.S. and China today, or in the near future, would be like. McCoy knows where the bodies are buried, and unfortunately that's not a metaphor, uh, and gives an account here that needs to be read. I, as I say, it's not unarguable, but it certainly needs to be read. Uh, a second article that I'm going to place on that Facebook page uh, is from Consortium News, Robert Perry's point on the new McCarthyism. Uh, I'm constantly astonished uh, about how the uh, political events of my youth are recurring in my old age, and McCarthyism is in some ways the most unlooked for, uh, uh, and it comes out of the... Uh, uh, political establishment, the very heart of the American political establishment, who would have thunk it? Uh, and finally, I'm going to put the flyer uh, for uh, the uh, local anti-war group AWARE uh, uh, anti-war demonstration uh, a week from tomorrow uh, on the uh, Facebook page for News from Neptune. If you, if you well. haven't seen the Morgan Freeman advertisement oh. for the Center for <laughs> Soviet Information or what, investigate the Soviet Union, it's, uh, you'd have to watch it to believe it. The consortium I mean, it article, the consortium article talks about it. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I don't, sort of you know, I'm not a fan of Morgan Freeman anyway for lots of reasons. He made a movie. One more, re one more reason. He made a movie with uh, uh, my nephew, the scriptwriter, a couple oh, of years ago. Oh. And uh, I, he's, he's a good actor. Yeah. But uh, anyone who, uh, you know, uh, the his ability as an actor uh, does not cover the fact that he's talking absolute nonsense in a good voice uh, in this particular piece. And Consortium News takes that up uh, and talks about it as an aspect of this new McCarthyism, which is, I, I'm torn between thinking it's simply silly and it's very dangerous. And I'm afraid it may be a mixture of both. You have been watching News from Neptune. Uh, the attempt to talk about the news of the week and the coverage coverage by the media. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in the uh, 39th week of 2017, presented by Carl Estabrook and David Breen, produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Ethan Young, uh, with thanks to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research. Uh, No's notes will be posted also on that Facebook page. And, and our friend Andrew also. Yeah. Yeah, Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. To remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come and yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies and a good night to you.